So um, we're going to have, uh, well, no, I, I got an announcement first and then we'll have prayer. Um, we partner with CareNet, CareNet of the Treasure Coast, and um, we've been doing that for the last five years at least since I've been here. And um, they are a, a, like a family crisis center. They work with families that are in crisis. And often that is uh, dealing with uh, un, uh, unplanned pregnancies and, uh, or families that have, maybe they are planning to have, but they uh, don't have certain things available to them. And uh, CareNet comes alongside of them and helps them. They, they do counseling, they do all kinds of things, but they also provide a lot of different services to families. And so we have partnered with them. And uh, they have a campaign that they do. And uh, I don't know. You're, you're, you're the expert. Here, come. Yeah. But Tam, Tammy, uh, she um, told me about this. And I was like, oh, yeah, we got to do that. Because um, they're our partners. And... Uh, if they're doing something like that, then we need to do it. So I'm going to let her explain it, and she, you can tell how we do it, okay? I volunteered at CareNet for the past 10 years, and every Mother's Day, they go through uh, churches throughout the Treasure Coast and have um, baby bottles. And um, you take them on Mother's Day, and throughout the month, um, any spare change that you get, you just put it inside the bottle. Um, you can also put, um, you know, dollar bills or checks in there. And I think they just newly added a little uh, code that you can scan on your phone. But anyway, um, you return them to the church, empty or, you know, full, and on Father's Day. So it goes from Mother's Day to Father's Day. And Mike, Gabby, and I, every year we, um, we had go to several change sorting parties. And we literally sort out the um, coins, and, and they make thousands of dollars um, with these baby bottles throughout the Treasure Coast, um, and it does go towards services. They offer sonograms to mothers that are unsure. They offer counseling to the fathers, the young fathers, the, you know, and they just offer so many services. We're also going to be collecting um, di diapers or anything for, for babies. And you would think that they would want, like, newborn, but they're actually looking for, like, the larger sizes, like fives and sixes, they said. So if you guys want to uh, provide a box of diapers, you can do that as well. But um, there's a poster over top of the display that explains everything. And every year they have a baby of the year um, that was saved from being aborted. And... Um, their story of the mother and, and how that baby's life was changed. And the, the one this year, she's, she's actually a grown girl now, very beautiful girl. So anyway, it's, it's neat. It's nice. <laughs> I agree. Thank you, Tammy. So when you leave, um, Tammy will be out there because she also has a little slip of paper she wants to give you. I don't know why I'm using this, but... You had it muted, yeah. <laughs> and um, so she'll be out there, and she'll help you, and and uh, take one or two bottles, okay, and um, you know just put some change in it over a month, okay, or uh, a dollar here, a dollar there, kind of thing. Um, and also, she mentioned on the side it has like a called QR code or something, the little code you scan on your phone, and you can give online if you want to, but. Um, this is a way for us that we can uh, support our partner in ministry. And uh, they're doing things that we can't do, right? I mean, as a church, but we can help them get that done. And so um, we, we have uh, appreciated all that they do and uh, want to continue to appreciate them this way. You know what the word appreciate means, right? Appreciate means to add value to something, right? If I say I appreciate something, it means I add value. And so if we pre appreciate them, we need to add value to them, okay? 
And so uh, we, we don't just say, I appreciate you, and then don't do anything, right? <laughs> so let's do something and help them. Thank you, Tammy and, and Sheila, both for uh, helping us with uh, getting everything set up and, and get that uh, uh, taken care of. And so over the next month, um, we'll be highlighting that, okay? Um, and as I said, uh, we'll do something here in a little bit. Sheila will have a part with others. Let's have prayer, and uh, we always have much to pray about, and uh, we want to uh, make available to each and every one of you the opportunity to share your needs. Does anyone have anything that you want us to uh, take in prayer, and, and then that'll be added to the prayer wall? Yes, Sheila. I need prayer for a friend of mine. Her name is Shelly. I mentioned it in a women's Bible study yesterday. Um, lost a nephew, knocked on the, got knocked off his bike on the 95, um, and succumbed to his injuries a few hours later in the hospital. So the family needs some prayer. Um, so I want you to pray for Shelly and her family in this difficult time yeah. because they don't know who knocked him, so they're depending on maybe the 95 cameras or if anyone see or saw the accident to come forth and help them with an even a license plate. Okay. okay. First for Denise, yeah. for our health to be yeah. better. Um, also for a coworker. Uh, who's also out, out so your coworker, Michael, yes. Who's also been uh, suffering from uh, the Symptoms, yeah, some type of infection. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people have been, there's a lot of sickness. It's not COVID, but it's just been, mm -hmm. I, I was saying, I think, you know, because we were so quarantined and, and mm -hmm. uh, masked up for so long, but now we're catching everything. <laughs> you know, people are, people are just getting sick, like left and right. Right from Mary Ann. Yes. She's, she's home. Yeah. But, uh, I believe she has pneumonia. Yeah. Teresa's mom. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Teresa's also been yes. still uh, struggling with a bad cough. So we'll pray for her as well. Yes. Teresa. Um, our friend Anita is part of the pro shaker. Yes. She's been ill for a while and she seems to be doing a little better, but she still needs our prayer. Yeah. Is she still in the hospital? She has she has yeah. Pray for Anita. Yeah, I mentioned the truth, yeah. We want to continue to pray. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. I just want to say a prayer to um, for the mothers that have lost children. Yeah. So we miss our mothers that we don't have always, but for yeah. those mothers that have lost their children, we pray for them. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is a hard time uh, for that. Um, there are many even here who may have had a miscarriage, or like in this case where uh, one is killed in an accident, you know, those are so hard. And then Mother's Day sometimes can be very difficult. Um, my mom and stepdad are, um, I found them a little Airbnb that they're staying at. They're supposed to close on their home um, May 31st to the first week in June. So, and they're finding that it's not as cut and dry as they thought it would be. And I'm just praying for no hiccups, that yeah. they get in their home and they can breathe and re yeah. you know, relax again. And I want to lift up special prayers for my son, Samuel. Um, <clears throat> he's lost. He's real lost. And, and I fight with him a lot. And it's out of love. It's not out of, you know, I don't like to fight with him. Um, but I, I pray that God puts people in his life, and, and God is putting people in his life. I shared also with the ladies' Bible study. <laughs> his boss, he goes to like the daily work, daily pay, and he has to commute with, and, and he plays Christian music, and he's a Christian man. And um, so I feel like that's a big step because Sam's company that he keeps is just not great. So I feel like God's putting people in his life um, because he's turned a deaf ear to me for so many years. You know, I'm just a 
wacko mom, you know. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> But yeah, let Sam up in prayer and um, and uh, my mom and yeah. dad. So okay. yeah. All right, would you stand with me if you can? And if you need to remain seated, that's fine. Um, but let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning and uh, you've given your people a caring heart. We care about other people. We care about our families and we care about our extended families, but we also care about our friends and, and uh, when things are uh, going awry and when people are sick, it, it causes us to want to pray for them and to bring them uh, before your throne. And we do that today as a body we bring a lot of people, people that are not even a part of this church, and we bring them to you because we care for them and you care about us. So Lord, we pray as, as uh, Pat was mentioning, for all of those mothers who have lost children um, in whatever way, Lord, um, we pray that today that you will wrap your loving arms around them and help them to know that you know, and you know their children, and you know uh, uh, their pain today. And so, Lord, we just pray for them. We pray for Denise and Teresa who are out today and not well. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them, and for John's co-worker, the same, Lord. These ones who are ill, we pray for them, Lord, that you would just raise them up. There's a lot of sickness going around. We pray that you would protect all of us from that. Um, we realize that we're all susceptible to catching something. And, and so, Lord, just protect us, we pray. We pray for uh, Anita, Lord, who's been uh, ill for a while with uh, um, uh, fluid issues and heart issues and breathing issues. We pray for her today that you would uh, just help her and touch her, Lord. And she's not part of our church, but she's connected through love covers. And we just pray for her. We pray for... Uh, this Shelly and her family who have uh, lost uh, a loved one, lost a son. Lord, we just pray for them. And as there is so much unknown about what happened, we pray, Lord, that you would give them peace and comfort. It's really hard when you don't have answers and you, a lot of questions about why and how could this happen. But Lord, we pray that you would comfort them today. We think of... Uh, Tammy's mom and dad, and they're trying to get settled, and um, they're, they're waiting for things to happen. Sometimes it seems like that May 31st will never come, and, and uh, so many things can happen in between. We just pray for them. Give them peace today. Help them to be able to uh, uh, enjoy each day, uh, and that, Lord, you would just allow these things to happen in the right time for them to get in their home. And and Lord, we pray for Sam today that you would be with him. And, and Lord, you know the, the struggle for his soul. You know that there's a, a, a war that's going on. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would be with him today. That uh, Lord, as you, uh, as you speak to him, maybe through others, even this employer, that Lord, you would um, uh, be able to win his heart. We realize, Lord, that we won't win the argument. We won't win. But you can win through your love and through your grace. And it may come through another person. Sometimes uh, families, <laughs> uh, mom and dad's voice are sometimes uh, the, the, the hardest one to hear. And yet they know it's true, but it's hard to hear. And so we pray that you'd put others in the, his life that would be able to speak truth into his, into his heart. And Lord, for each and every one of us here, that uh, we have our own issues and struggles. Lord, um, we ask that you would just uh, help us to turn those over to you. There's a lot of things that are going on in the lives of everyone here that others don't know about and that uh, uh, we, we may never know, but you do. And we pray, Lord, today that you would minister to each and every heart and that when we leave from this place, we'll know that we've met with God and God has heard our prayer. 
And so go with us, we pray, uh, that we might be able to be your hands and feet, whether it's through giving money in a bottle, or whether it's through speaking an encouraging word to uh, the lady who's checking us out at Walmart, whatever it is this week, help us to be your example, your hands, your feet. We don't know, Lord, how you want to use us this coming week, but use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Um, I don't have a clicker. Uh, do you have that? you want me to use that, or you guys want to? Um, the picture on the screen, uh, yesterday the, uh, the, ladies, the ladies met, and um, thank you. And um, they had a great time, I understand. And uh, they had a lot of good food. And my wife brought home a plate of that. And, uh, and I was, wow, okay. Um, we, we men, we don't know what we're missing, you know. Oh, you ate too, okay. So. Ada brought home some for you. Um, but anyway, it was very good. It, it, oh, he, oh, he was here. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he pretended that he came to, to uh, work outside, but he was really here to get the food. So anyway, um, if, you know, when the ladies get together, I encourage you, get with the ladies and... Um, and uh, fellowship together, um, get to know one another, and, um, and enjoy just being around uh, others of like faith. Amen? All right, so um, let's see here. Kids worship. At this time, the kids are going to go to their worship. And so Samuel, you and, and uh, France Lee and your sister and... Sarah, Sarah has, I know, <laughs> so, <laughs> cuteness overload. So today I want to, I want to bring a, a Mother's Day um, message to us, and, uh, but it's also for us men. And uh, there's much to be said um, when it comes to uh, motherhood. And oftentimes uh, we um, men kind of think that, well, that doesn't have anything to do with us. But it really does. It has everything to do with you. And even in this uh, um, very well-known passage of Scripture from Proverbs 31, um, there's much for us to understand uh, when it comes to um, uh, a, you know the uh, King James calls it a virtuous woman, you know. Um, so anyway, Mother's Day is uh, kind of that day. It's kind of a weird day because um, uh, you know everybody goes out to eat. So it's it's the uh, the most uh, most people go out to eat on Mother's Day more than any other day of the year. More flowers are bought on Mother's Day than any other day of the year, okay? More phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. And so we fathers have learned that we're chopped liver, okay? Because we're not even in the top ten probably in any one of those, you know? I mean, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like what did we do, you know, to to, you know, how come Father's Day is not, you know, Father's Day we grill out, right? And the father has to grill, <laughs> right? Okay, I think, Michael, we need to start something here in, you know, a revolution of something, some sorts, right? But, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but the sad thing is that oftentimes Mother's Day is just really a time when, uh, um, sons and daughters try to atone, you know, for an entire year of neglect and, and disrespect. Um, 
you know, and, and a lack of a whole year of appreciating um, mom. And it shouldn't be that way, but I, unfortunately it kind of is. And I think most people agree, I, whether they are a, a Christ follower or not, that, you know, we're living in a, what we call a post-Christian era, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that the church is dead or that Christianity is dead, but it does mean that the influence that, the, that biblical Christianity uh, once had on culture, on our nation, has diminished to the point where it wouldn't even be recognized by your parent and grandparent. You know? Um, and, and that includes uh, morality in our society. That includes uh, our educational system. Uh, you know, I, I grew up when I was a kid. Um, we started class in public school. We started class every morning with prayer and reading the Bible. Public school, you know. Um, uh, social action in our culture today, uh, we don't. We wouldn't recognize it from uh, generations before. Um, but I think maybe most important is that the impact that a post-Christian culture has on the family and on parenting. Basically what has happened is that secular humanistic reasoning has taken the place of biblical truth when it comes to setting the parameters for the home and family. And by contrast, you know, a Christian should be one who, you know, they see the home they see marriage, they see parenting as framed within the parameters of God's infallible authoritative Word, right? The Bible. And the truths of God's Word should not only shape what we believe and what we practice, but they are absolutes that guide us in every area of life. And so my opinions and my beliefs are only legitimate as a Christian to the degree that they line up with God's Word. Okay? And the problem is that today our minds have been darkened by secularism and sin and a lot of folks can't tell if something is biblical or if it's sec secular at all. They don't even know the difference, right? And we expect that from the world, right? We expect that the world doesn't understand. But we're actually seeing the same thing within the church, people who are in the church. The trend that we're seeing in the church is that church folks are uh, acknowledging the suffic sufficiency of God and the Bible, but they fail to see a need to subject their personal opinions, reasoning, and emotions to the guidelines of Scripture in all areas of life, including what happens in the home. I mean, I hear professing Christians say something like this. I know what the Bible says, but I feel or I think, and you go, and then they add what they feel and think, right? And my response is, oh, really? You feel that way. You think that way. Somehow, I don't think that God is looking for Bible editors. Okay? We read something like this in Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 2. It says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we think that only applies to maybe our moral behavior. And not necessarily to things like our marriage or how we raise our kids. Instead, we leave those things like our marriage, we get our marriage advice and, and how to raise kids from pop culture, from psychologists and from talk show hosts right? 
I don't know where you get your uh, marriage advice, but uh, you know, a lot of people seem to get their, uh, their marriage advice and, and their parenting advice from like Oprah and Dr. Phil, you know, or the, the morning talk shows, right? And, and they have a segment on parenting. Yeah, I want to get my advice from them, right? Or do you get your advice from Proverbs? Or from the Gospels? Huh? All of our relationships should be directed by the truth of Scripture. Whether it's education, whether it's my finances, whether it's my political involvement, our jobs, our marriages, or how we parent. It needs to be directed from the truth of Scripture. Not from my feelings. Not from my... by worldly arguments. And having said that, I want us to then look at Proverbs 31. Verses 10-31. through 31. So it's a, a lengthy uh, Scripture, but it's packed. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purples. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity, She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Whoops. Wow. That's a mouthful, isn't it? (laughs) There are about five things, though, that I just want to highlight before I get into uh, too deep here that I, I... When I just glean through this, there are like five things. If you look at uh, some of these verses, I'm not going to click back at them, but verses 11, 12, and then 23, you're going to see that this woman that he's talking about is a trustworthy and devoted woman, right? She has her husband's confidence and she enhances his reputation, okay? Okay? She makes her husband look good. (laughs) She's a woman of diligence and wisdom. In verses 13, we see that she's not afraid to work. She's a wise shopper. Okay? She's not a frivolous shopper. And she plans ahead. And then you see in verse 20 that she's a giving person, that she extends her hand to the poor. In other words, she's planned ahead well enough to be able not only to take care of her own needs, but to help take care of other people's needs. 
And then we see in verses 15, 21, and 27 that she's dependable. When adversity comes, right? When the storms of life come, you know that she's already got a plan to deal with whatever it might be. And lastly, she's a woman who loves the Lord. We see that by reading really throughout that entire text. She is someone who is guided and directed by God's Word and by God's wisdom. I know that like when I encapsulate cap- that, that you're going, uh, that's, that's not even possible, right? You know, this isn't describing a woman. This is describing superwoman, right? Uh, this, is, uh, this is someone who, you know, nobody has it all that well put together, right? And that's actually, I think, probably a pretty good assessment. When you read that, you're, you're going, whoa. Uh, but it's, think about it. It's describing a woman who is living in a supernatural way with a supernatural God. See, a lot of times we think that, well, I can't do that. Right? I think in Bible study the other night we were talking about this, that we have a, a conflict in our lives between our formal theology and our a practical theology. And our formal theology says, with God all things are possible. But in our practical th- theology, when things don't look good, we're wondering, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know? Because this, this isn't possible. This isn't. But we say, I know that with God all things are possible. And so we look at a, a woman like this and say, that's not possible. Well, if we say that with God all things are possible, then we know that if someone is living in a supernatural way with a supernatural God, that it is possible. And it has to be that way because there are few things that are more important to our society than godly mothers. When I think of my mother, I often wonder where I would be because I tended to be a little more like Sam if I didn't have a mother who was godly, who prayed, who loved me in spite of my uh, waywardness. The Bible is clear in its teaching, both in an explicit way and also implicitly, that the family is the foundation of society, right? And while fathers are responsible for the way the family goes, for direction, mothers are the glue that holds that plan and that vision all together, right? It's kind of like the dad says, let's go! Right? And the mom goes, okay, now I'm responsible for all the stuff to get it there. Right? I remember when our son was about five years old and my wife and I were having an argument in the car. You know? And it wasn't violent. It was just, you know, we're like disagreeing and he's sitting in the back and, and he's like, stop! You know, stop arguing. And I said, Travis, you need to understand something. I said, Dad is the head of the house. He said, well, you might be the head of the house, but Mom's the boss. (laughs) Some things ring true, don't it? You know? And so since moms are so important to the family and society... I want to just quickly look at some of the problems that they face so that the rest of us can really show appreciation uh, on Mother's Day um, and hopefully, you know, every other day of the year so you don't have so much to make up every Mother's Day, you know. First of all, gentlemen, we need to look at motherhood and femininity with respect. And I'm not talking about feminism, I'm talking about femininity. Okay? The Bible warns us over and over again about the anti-Christian forces 
that are constantly at work to get us to adopt the values and the attitudes of the world. It's constantly pushing in on us, right? We have even more than, say, in biblical times, right, with media. And I don't mean the news. I mean, that's part of it. But just media, right? Songs, uh, movies, TV, Netflix, Hulu, Voodoo, Disney+, Plus, Paramount, Peacock. They're all just bombarding us. Got to watch this. Got to watch this. Got to watch this. Right? But Romans 12, let's go back to that. It tells us that we are not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. We are supposed to be shoved into... uh, We aren't supposed to be shoved into that mold that the world has created. And it's very easy to be because it takes a lot of resistance to not be. To not, what? Conform. Let me just be blunt if I can about what I mean by that. Motherhood is way more important than any career. Okay? I'm not saying that women can't have a career. Or can't do both. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that he says, I have a right to do anything. Yes, you have the right to do this. You have the right to do that. But he says not everything is beneficial. Just because you have the right to do it and you even have the skill to do it and you even have the money to do it and you even have the ability to do it, that's fine. It doesn't mean that you should do it. Right? If it's not beneficial. I'm just saying that it's important that we, both men and women, that verse of Scripture is not just for women, it's for all of us, uh, need to understand what is most important. Okay? What is the most important thing? Not just what do I want to do or what my dreams are. And, and you know, in America, it's all about live out your dreams. It's like, what if we lived out God's dream? rather than just live out our dreams. Paul writing to Timothy, he says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to do, have nothing to do with such people. Notice what Paul's saying here. He's telling Timothy that the times to come, these perilous times that are going to come, people will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money, boasting, pride, blasphemous, all sins that come from loving oneself. Right? It's another way of saying people are self-centered. Right? Selfishness, see, is the center and the centerpiece of all sin. Every sin. Selfishness. I want. This is what I want. I want to do this. I don't want to do that. I, I, I. All sin centers on You. Selfishness. We have seen, you know, in our nation and now broadcast over the last week or so, the whole argument about abortion again and and so forth. Right? Selfishness is the reason abortion is in demand. 
You understand? Selfishness is the reason. It is why you see people so angry at just the notion that the right to kill their unborn baby may be harder for them to access. Just the idea of that makes them mad. Why would they be so mad? Because they are lovers of themselves. This isn't a problem only for women. Oh, no, no, no. You understand, more, women, more men support abortion than women. Oh, yeah. Why? Because they are lovers of themselves, right? I want to remove any obstacle that gets in the way of what I want. And so often a child gets in the way of what I want. And the passage goes on, but this is, you know, to tell a bunch of other stuff, but this is the world that we live in, right? And so, what do you think this does to the woman who by the very nature of their creation is geared to needing love? and affection, and reassurance. What does it do when the husband loves himself more than his wife? Or when he loves money more than his wife? <coughs> or he loves his freedom more than he loves his wife? You see, Satan's first attack was against the wife. And it immediately affected the home, didn't it? And he's still attacking us today, including moms and wives today. But then you couple that with the fact that people, often husband people, those kind of people, are lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They're proud. Their kids are sometimes disobedient. People are unthankful, unloving. And these humanistic, unbiblical ideas and beliefs and behavior patterns, they begin to affect the family and the home and they especially affect the mother because she is the keeper of the home. And if the father is not the protector of the home, that's not her role. And those of us who are husbands and fathers, we need to take note of this. Because even though our wives are to be the keepers, we're supposed to be the protectors. In other words, we should not allow these sorts of things to infiltrate our homes and our lives and the lives of our families. We can't, you know, you can't do a whole lot about what's out in the world, right? But we can make sure that it isn't infiltrating our own homes. The father should protect his family from all intruders, right? We go, yeah, you got to protect, you know, if somebody comes and breaks in your home, right? You got to stand up, protect your family. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know who's coming into your kid's room through the devices that you gave them? Huh? Do you know who's, who you're kids are watching and, and who they're listening to and, and what they're uh, accessing. Listen, a lot of times we use the word they're accessing. No, 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 no. They're accessing your kids. It's not your kids accessing them. Do you know? Are you protecting them? Are you their protector? All right, well, let's get back to Proverbs 31 here. We saw from the text the demands on mothers are unbelievable in some ways. Awesome. Even if she's working outside the home, you know, the mom still is seeing, you know, uh, she does the grocery shopping, she prepares the meals, uh, washing and ironing, and uh, we don't iron a whole lot anymore, but um, house cleaning, you know, chauffeuring the family around, caring for the needs of the family, and on and on and on. And we look at that list and we go, the lady that's doing all of these things is probably a basket case, right? Borderline 
crazy. Okay? So in the little bit of time I have left, I, I just want to quickly talk about how moms can handle all of this without going ballistic, without losing their, their minds. Okay? And it begins with this. It begins with a loving husband and obedient children. That's where it begins. Guys, to love your wife sacrificially, I don't mean you sacrifice your wife. I, okay, to love your wife sacrificially means that you help out. Take ownership of your home. Right? The clothes, the dishes, toilets are yours to use. And so they are also yours to clean. It's not be beneath you to do the laundry or to uh, do the dishes or to clean the bathrooms. And that's one way that we can help our wives be this no woman of noble character, a, a virtuous woman. By helping out around the house. Something I don't think God likes is a freeloading husband. Right? A, a couch potato. You know? Sit there and watch TV while the wife's working all over. She's worked all week and now it's her day to clean the house and cook and get everything ready. And you're sitting there watching the ball game and you're going, hey honey, uh, can you move out of the way? Or, you know, you're getting, you know. Secondly, this one's uh, on the wives and moms, and that is they, they need to have their priorities straight, right? In Luke chapter 10, uh, you're going to read a story uh, about uh, Mary and Martha and Jesus, right? And Jesus had come to their house, and Mary, she found time to sit at the feet of Jesus, to be near Him, and she wanted to learn from Him. While Martha, we know, she got busy working, Right? Cooking and cleaning and all that stuff. She found plenty of things to do so that she didn't have to get alone and be with Jesus. And you go, well, she probably would never admit that that was what was going on. But if you read that passage, that's what's implied there. Okay? And then Martha had the nerve to complain to Jesus later about Mary's unwillingness to join her in her sin of busyness. Right? Mary, she relished any chance to sit at Jesus' feet, even if the dishes were stacked high. Right? Now I hope everyone realizes that this is the same Mary that goes to the tomb on Sunday morning and is the first person to see the resurrected Lord. She was then commissioned to be the first evangelist. He said, go and tell them, right? And I don't know if it's lost on you, but after that occasion in Luke chapter 12, there is no more mention of Martha. Huh? No more mention. And what we learn from this is that moms need to make Mary's priority their own priority. It doesn't mean that they ignore the other duties of motherhood. It means that they prioritize and have their priorities straight. On the flip side, mothers who end up making Martha's priorities their own Clean house, everything in order, everything's just perfect. Boom, 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 right? Well, they end up like Martha, too. They find themselves full of resentment, self pity, and tension. Why am I the only one who cares about these things? We see Jesus himself took time to pray and to be alone with his heavenly Father. Moms, do you find yourself so busy that you don't take time to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to His Word and take your burdens and cares to Him? The Bible makes it pretty clear that no wife or husband or mom or dad 
can be the kind of spouse or parent that God has called them to be without the Lord's help. In fact, Jesus said it this way, without me, you can do nothing. Now let's look at the last couple verses here where he said, I'm not going to go back on the screen, but he said, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. The woman who finds her value in her looks will either have so much plastic surgery and Botox done that she'll end up looking like something out of a horror show, right? You've seen them. Or she will devalue her worth to the point of self-loathing. Because age and gravity eventually sets in on every one of us, right? But the woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. That's not the way the world does it, you know. The, the, the world praises people for their outward beauty, right? They spotlight them constantly. God puts a spotlight on the woman who fears Him. Scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the woman who fears the Lord doesn't have to toot her own horn. She doesn't have to brag or boast about what she's accomplished. Her own works, he says, will praise her. People will see it and they'll know it. Her children will rise up and call her blessed and her husband will praise her. So let me encourage you moms here this morning. God doesn't call you to be perfect. He calls you to walk in His perfection. It's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit, declares the Lord. So take time to sit at the feet of Jesus. In other words, take time to get into the Word. Read the Bible. Study the Word. Learn the Scriptures. Memorize the Scriptures. And you do that, and before long, you'll find that you're living the Bible. I remember a professor I had in college, and he'd get up like 4 o'clock in the morning to pray. And someone says, why? And he'd pray for like 2 or 3 hours every morning. And someone said, why do you get up so early to pray? And he says, because I've got so much to do. Kind of the opposite of a lot of people, right? i got so much to do, I don't have time to pray. He said, i got so much time to do, I need to take time to pray. And you as mothers, you have so much to do, you need to take time to be in the Word, to be with the Father, and to pray. Compare what God's Word says with what the world says. And if they differ, you need to reject the world's point of view. And lastly, keep your eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. Lay aside, Scripture says, every weight of sin that so easily besets us and look unto the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen? You as mothers, as wives, you've got a, a lot on your plate. And because you have a lot on your plate, you need to put a lot of God into your life. And husbands, you need to support your wives in that. You need to Say, hey, honey, I'll do the dishes tonight. You go and relax. Some of you wives are like, who is this guy? (laughs) I've not met him yet. (laughs) 
Happy Mother's Day. I hope that you, your kids will rise up and call you blessed.